Good morning. Um, so I'd like to start with uh, a few conceptual questions, and then I will go through an example from the Biosavar law and an example from Gauss's law, and then we will uh, wrap up this uh, last lecture. Uh, before I start, any questions that uh, you want to discuss? Okay. Then also, before I uh, start, let me um, make a small request that uh, you submit your course evaluations. Uh, they are uh, online, and I think that they will be available for just a few more days. Uh, they are important. It, is, it doesn't take too much time from your end, but uh, it is important for us uh, to gauge what has gone uh, right and what has gone wrong in this uh, course, which is squeezed in a very busy uh, term for you. Uh, the other uh, thing I wanted to say is that I will announce several office hours for the exam, but if these do not work for you uh, because of other conflicts, uh, please feel free to send me an email to schedule an appointment so that we can discuss. If you cannot come to campus, I'm fine to go on, on, online and uh, uh, discuss with you whatever questions you may have. So please do not hold back. Make sure that you have all your questions answered uh, until the 23rd, which is the final exam. So uh, here's a few uh, brief questions, which hopefully I have clarified already. Uh, first, can the displacement current exist in vacuum? Yes or no? So how many say yes? How many say no? So it can exist in vacuum. That's the point about uh, the displacement current. That displacement current basically requires just a time-varying electric field. So the answer here is yes, because you get a displacement current density whenever you have time-varying electric field. So therefore, if you are in vacuum, simply this epsilon is epsilon naught. So it does exist. I will skip the next one to the third. Uh, the displacement current causes magnetic field in the same way conduction current does. True or false? Choose the correct answer and briefly explain. So this, is, uh, this compares how magnetic field is created by conduction current. For example, a wire creates magnetic field that is circulating around it. We saw this in uh, magnetostatics. So now the question is if I have, let's say, in a capacitor, Displacement current. The displacement current is associated with uh, electric field, changing electric field. So let's say the electric field here inside the capacitor is uh, changing with time, and therefore you have displacement current. Would this create a uh, magnetic field the same way that uh, ordinary current does? Who says yes? Who says no? Who votes yes? No? So it is again yes. <laughs> so, uh, and it is yes, uh, you can refer to the example, it's all good. You can refer to the example uh, that we had uh, solved uh, a few lectures ago where I found actually the magnetic field inside the capacitor. When you have a uh, changing magnetic, um, a changing electric field, there is an associated magnetic field and that is actually again circulating, just like with the ordinary wires. You see, in uh, not even a few years, but maybe a few weeks, you will have forgotten most of what we have discussed about. Uh, but there are some take home points, and one of those is precisely this that the reason that we have wireless technology today is precisely because of this that you don't need a wire. Uh, to generate a magnetic field. And uh, therefore, you can transmit information without wires. You can transmit it wirelessly, precisely because if you have a time-varying electric field, that will generate a magnetic field. And then the magnetic field from Faraday's law will generate an electric field. And the interplay between those two creates this effect of propagation that wireless communication systems are based upon. So indeed, you can uh, refer to this example to see how this works, but also you can refer to simply to the law. The law says, the Amper Maxwell law says that H dot DL, that is what we call magnetomotive force, is equal to 
conduction current and displacement current. So you see from the perspective of the law, the displacement current and the conduction current are two terms that have exactly the same effect on the right hand side. Uh, you can swap uh, the labels and the one becomes the other and the law does not change. And therefore, uh, the mm. physics follows, uh, I mean, the law follows the physics to begin with, but in this case, if you want to use the law to understand the physics, this is the easiest way to do it. Uh, so you see two equivalent terms on the right hand side. So the displacement current, indeed, that is a true statement generates magnetic field the same way uh, that conduction current does. So this is the first round of questions. Let me just go to the next set of uh, questions. I think this is it. OK. Uh, here we are talking about uh, electric field boundary conditions. So assume there is no surface free charge on the boundary between the two perfect dielectric media shown. Uh, so we have uh, two dielectric uh, media at an interface, a planar interface. Uh, what is indicated here is the relative dielectric permittivity, 4 and 2 respectively. And we have possibilities for the electric field on the one region and the other. Uh, so E1 is the electric field on, in medium 1, E2 the electric field in medium 2. It's asking the question which of the figures represents Possible electric field intensity vectors. Possible electric field intensity vectors. So obviously this points to the fact that some of these arrangements violate boundary conditions at this interface and hence they are not possible to exist. So let me begin from the first one. The first one you see says that the two fields have the same tangential components, that E1t is equal to E2t. Indeed, this is the most important boundary condition that we learned in the course, that tangential electric field across a material interface remains continuous. This is precisely what allows you to never doubt whether the voltage that you measure in a resistor is the one that you measure on the left or on the right or front or back of a resistor. The electric field remains continuous across the interface. You are relying upon this fact. The resistor is a conducting medium. So you have an interface, you have actually in a resistor that you measure in a circuit slab, you have two interfaces, air to conduct, uh, uh, conducting medium, conducting medium to air. The electric field across those interfaces remains continuous, tangential to this interface. And that is the one that creates the voltage that you measure. So you never doubt whether you will put the voltmeter here or here or here or there. So this is one boundary condition that really uh, you have been using uh, knowing or without knowing uh, in, in many instances. So that is the most fundamental one. And you see that other arrangements violate it. So this one, for example, has this is the tangential component of the first, this is the tangential component of the second. So since these are unequal, this cannot exist. And the same problem exists on also right here. In fact, uh, in this case, the tangential components appear to be even opposite to each other, so this cannot happen either. <coughs> so now we have the last one. The last one, in fact, just like the first one, passes the first test. Indeed, the tangential components are continuous, so this is fine. And therefore, I, I now go, now that I have actually uh, selected those two cases, I go to the second boundary condition. The second boundary condition, if you remember, is that comes from Gauss's law. And it says that normal components of the d vector of the electric flux density can vary only, can be different only if there is a surface charge density. We derive this by applying Gauss's law on a cylinder that we let its height to go to zero at the interface between those two media. 
So if you apply here Gauss's law, d dot ds equals to q enclosed, you can find that this uh, d dot ds is proportional to this difference between the normal components because it uh, basically uh, is uh, capturing the flux due to the first component from the uh, top and the um, flux due to d1 through the bottom. So therefore, this one uh, basically is equal to d2n minus d1n, the normal components, times the area of the cylinder. Uh, because we let the height of the cylinder go to zero, we had no flux through the sides. The flux through the sides goes to zero. So this was the uh, exercise that we run when we derive this boundary condition. And then on the right hand side, you can only have enclosed charge in this exercise where you squeeze the cylinder to the interface if there is surface charge density right on the interface. Otherwise, uh, you won't be enclosing any charge. So now the exercise tells us that, uh, the question tells us that, in fact, there is no Rosa Bess. So in the absence of Rosa Bess, then uh, the right hand side is zero, and those two components are continuous. So in this last case, you see that, in fact, this is uh, E2n, the normal component, and this is E1n. And you see that they are, in fact, uh, opposite in direction. So then if you take the d vectors, the d components, epsilon 2 and epsilon 1, they appear to be opposite. Instead of being continuous and the same, they appear to be opposite. Well, that cannot happen because uh, we know that they have to be the same. D2n has to be equal to D1n, so therefore this won't cut it. On the other hand, we have now this one here, epsilon 1n, and uh, this is, sorry, this is epsilon 2 normal, and this is epsilon 1 normal. And again, if uh, you have trouble understanding what is tangential, what is normal, tangential just, the tangential component, as you see here, goes along the interface, the normal component pokes the interface. So the tangential component would not poke, does not poke the interface. It just goes parallel to the interface. The normal pokes the interface. And uh, you see here that I have E1 normal and E2 normal. They are obviously not equal to each other. However, you see that uh, this dielectric here is actually smaller than this. So one can actually conceive uh, approximately the way that I have drawn the figure. You will see indeed that uh, E2n is twice E1n. So if you now multiply E1n by 4 and E2n by 2, those two will become approximately the same. It's a graphical problem, but you see that they can actually, if you uh, multiply E1n by 4, it will give you this D1n, and it will look like this. And then if you multiply this by 2, it will give you uh, E2n, and it will be like this, D2n, and it will be like this. So indeed, this seems to satisfy the second boundary condition. So therefore, this is the only plausible arrangement out of all these arrangements. Okay. So that is uh, a small question on the boundary conditions. I think this one uh, you may have seen uh, before. A point charge is placed at the center of a closed cubic surface. Find the electric flux d dot ds through the upper side of the cube. Okay, through the upper side of the cube. So uh, here we have a few concepts at play. First of all, it's Gauss's law. So Gauss's law says that If I take d dot ds through the entire cube, that will give me the enclosed charge, which is only this cube. So the cube has six faces. And the field that is generated by the point charge in the middle is actually symmetric. So we have uh, 
a field that is symmetric. So you see by symmetry that each face of the cube will intercept the same amount of flux. And therefore, one of them will intercept one sixth of the flux. And therefore, through only the top, we have q over 6. So the entire cube, the flux through the entire cube is q. So through one phase, since the field of the point charge is symmetric, will be one sixth. Okay, so that is uh, one uh, question to remind you of Gauss's law. Uh, okay, any questions up to this point? All right, so then let me uh, go to a small example I have here. with uh, the Biot-Savar law. Uh, so the question uh, asks for the magnetic flux density on the z-axis due to the current supported on a washer. And uh, this is uh, the current that flows on this washer. So let me uh, write the question, find B on the z-axis due to a surface current density uh, on z equal zero and uh, R between A and B. So this is uh, a little washer that can be described in uh, cylindrical coordinates. And the surface current density is Js equal to J naught A over R in the phi direction. Okay. So this is uh, a a question that clearly points to the Biot-Savar law because we don't have any particular symmetry in the problem. We don't have an infinite line current or a solenoid or a toroid and so on. So we cannot make any argument about the um, uh, magnetic uh, field lines that will allow us to uh, pick an, um, a path and apply, let's say, Ampere's law and find the magnetic field. So this is clearly one that can be solved uh, by the Biot-Savar law. So the Biot-Savar is very similar to Coulomb's law in its mechanics in the sense that just like Coulomb's law tells you what will be the electric field created by a point charge, the Biot-Savar law tells you what will be the magnetic field that will be created by not a point charge. Remember, in magnetism, we have replaced the notion of the point charge with the elementary current I over length dl. And uh, we use prime coordinates always for the sources at position vector r prime. So I have here this current. And the Biot-Savar law tells me how much magnetic flux density this current will produce at an observation point r. And uh, it says that it will be equal to that dB, that elementary magnetic flux that will be produced by this elementary current, uh, mu naught by 4 pi I dL prime R minus R primed by R minus R prime cubed. So in Coulomb's law and the Biot-Savar law, I recommend it that you follow a few steps in order to get yourself started and pursue the solution to the problem. The first is choose the coordinate system. Here the coordinate system 
is basically chosen for you anyway uh, with uh, the specification of the problem in cylindrical coordinates. Uh, and therefore, I will stick to that. So I hope that the geometry is clear. We're talking about a washer, so it is uh, a that supports this uh, surface current density. Uh, would that be an artificial problem or a real problem? So how could this current be generated? Changing magnetic flux. Changing magnetic flux. So this could have been an eddy current. Uh, in the demonstration yesterday of the jumping rings, we created such currents on the rings. So you could have as well created that current in the washer. And then you would ask the question, OK, now that current, how much secondary field does, does it produce? So the coordinate system is here cylindrical. I'll stick to cylindrical coordinates. The second is find these terms on the Biot-Savart law. So find all terms for this dB. <clears throat> so that means that I will go and uh, uh, let me uh, uh, draw the, the uh, washer on the xy plane so that you see it a bit more clearly. So this is the inner radius A, the inner circle, and then outer circle B. So the current flows, if this is the xy plane, the current flows in the phi direction, so it flows this way throughout this surface. So I pick a point on the, the washer right here, so with uh, a position vector r primed. And I will see a current that flows like this. Uh, so I dl primed for that particular current will be, first of all, I have here this j sub s. Uh, and let me uh, say the position vector here will be, again, referring to your age sheet. And it is quite important to familiarize yourself again with uh, using this age sheet. If you go and uh, check position vectors in cylindrical coordinates, the general formula is this one. But now the washer is at z equal 0, is on the z equal 0 plane. The uh, problem specifies it right here. So the washer is on the z equal 0 plane. And hence, this is actually 0. And therefore, my uh, position vector is uh, r primed, r hat primed. Again, for non-Cartesian coordinates, we have to be careful and keep the primes in there. So because you see that. The, uh, the process that we are running, both in Coulomb's law and Biot's law, is that we are taking either a charge distribution or here a current distribution. We subdivide it to either, in Coulomb's law, point charges. In the Biot's law, elementary currents, differentially small currents. And then, so currents like this. And then we will run superposition. That is, I will move this current element throughout the distribution. So therefore, it is important to keep the prime here so that when I integrate this position vector of the element that will be scanning the entire distribution will follow those elements that I consider each time. So I have then A over R primed, phi primed as the current density. Current density, this is a surface current density in amps per meter. So this current flows like this. And remember that every time I need to convert the surface current density to current, I need to, to multiply by 
length by the width over which this current flows. So this is a differentially small current that actually cuts a differentially small length in the radial direction, dr primed. So this is now my IDL. Uh, sorry, uh, my I, uh, uh, it is my I. So the I is, let me put this on the other side. This dr primed is the I, and I, the current flows in the phi, hat, phi prime direction. So amps per meter times meter. So here I have the I. And to complete the DL, now the length of the current is this length here, which is the arc length R primed d phi primed. So basically, this uh, is a surface current density. I, if you refer again to your uh, aid sheet, you will see that the differential surface element in cylindrical coordinates He has three expressions. You can see it uh, right there. Uh, it has the uh, first expression R, or maybe I will uh, skip the primes now, just uh, like you see it in, the, in your uh, aid sheet. So R, R d phi dz, phi um, dr dz and z r d phi dr okay z r d phi dr so therefore there are these three possibilities for the area on which this elementary surface current is supported However, you see that possibility one, possibility two are not applicable here because the washer is on the z equal zero plane. So for the washer, z is fixed. Therefore, dz has to be zero. And hence, the only one is r d phi dr. r d phi dr. So I should expect to see the d phi and the dr in this expression over there. Well, the dr prime has already come in because of the um, uh, current. And this current now flows in along this arc length, which is r primed d phi primed. So this is the dl now. So this is the dl primed of the current flow. Okay. If you want a shortcut to the final result, here is the shortcut. That IDL has to be JS DS primed. And that JS is what is being given, A over R primed, DR uh, phi primed. DS primed can be one of those three. Again, I reject those two because I am on the washer, so dz is zero, and I have only this last possibility, r prime, d phi prime, dr prime. So this is a shortcut to the same result without having to worry about interpreting the current and uh, the direction and uh, finding the width over which the current flows. It will be exactly the same. Okay. Uh, any questions up to this point? Questions? So I have this basically is the most difficult term to find. Yes, please. Can you repeat why you use the prime notation? Be, be, uh, why I use what? The prime notation. The prime notation. So always, since the Coulomb's law, whenever you are talking about coordinates of sources, then you need to use prime coordinates. 
So in those uh, laws, the Coulomb law and the Biot-Savart law, we apply the same process. So we break down the distribution to elementary charges, point charges, or here, elementary currents. And the observation point always has fixed coordinates. right? But then we are running a process that's equivalent to the following. We find the dB that each one of those currents on the distribution will create. And then we add them all up by superposition, which means that we are running an integral. So therefore, if you didn't prime the coordinates of the sources, you wouldn't be able to distinguish between the observer that stays fixed and the sources that need to be superimposed over the distribution. You see, that's why uh, this bookkeeping is needed. Uh, yes, please. Um, you, used, you wrote down three different forms from the formula sheet for DS, and you used the last one, but you didn't use the Z hat of like, direction vector. Where does that? Right, because uh, here it is not needed. I need only to find the area of the distribution. So uh, these are DS vectors. So they provide also the vectors. Uh, and they have the form normal vector times ds area. So here I use this part of the age sheet. I don't think that uh, you will find ds separate in the age sheet. You will find this vector. So you can uh, basically read what is on the right in order to find what is the actual area of this elementary, um, uh, this, uh, elementary surface. So when will we need to use also the normal? Uh, when you calculate, for example, flux integrals. When you calculate flux integrals. So you see here, the vector is provided already by the current. And ds is there uh, in order to uh, find the uh, right scalar terms and you to multiply uh, the surface current density in order to give you this IDL. But the vector of dl. Uh, because it points in the direction of the current flow, is already provided by the current. So I don't need to look for it over there. Any other questions? So again, maybe this uh, second uh, way of uh, obtaining IDL is a bit faster uh, in the sense that you put in the uh, current density and then you look for a ds, the area, not the vector, since the vector is already in from the current distribution. OK. So now the rest of the elements in this Biot-Savar law are r prime I have already written. I have r, the position vector of the observation point. So the observation point is on the z-axis. So it will be z, z hat. Uh, since it is on the z-axis, its r-coordinate is 0. The r-coordinate in the cylindrical coordinate system measures distance from the z-axis. If you are on the z-axis, that distance is 0. And therefore, there is no r component there. And then we have a few other terms. For example, r minus r primed, that will be z, z hat minus r primed, r hat primed. The magnitude r minus r primed is z squared. And therefore, I can now put together the dB. Oh, uh, before I go to the dB, let me also do the cross product. So before I assemble all the terms, I did the same in Coulomb's law. Uh, I actually calculate everything that I need to put in into the formula. So I won't even do a cross product. I will do the cross product before I assemble the formula. So IDL primed cross R minus R primed, that will be the uh, J naught R 
are primed. D5 prime, DR prime. So you see here, I have also a cancellation of this R primed. And then I have the phi hat primed, uh, ZZ hat minus R primed, R hat. Okay. So uh, remember the cross products for cylindrical coordinates. I had given you this uh, mnemonic rule that whenever I have r cross phi that gives me the next neighbor, which is z, if I'm moving to the right, that will be plus z. If I do r cross z, the next neighbor is phi. If I'm moving to the left, that will be minus phi. So I have here phi cross z, phi prime cross z, that will give me r prime. Phi prime cr cross r prime will give me minus z. I don't say z primed because Cartesian vectors are always fixed in space. So therefore, there is no point in saying x prime, y prime, z prime. Cartesian unit vectors, unlike all other unit vectors, are actually fixed in space. So they don't change. On the other hand, you see that uh, the r hat unit vector, let's say, or the phi hat unit vector will change as you move on the washer. So for different points, it will have a different direction. So all in all, I have here J naught A D phi prime, dr primed. This phi cross z will give me r primed because I'm doing phi prime cross z. And then uh, phi prime cross uh, r hat primed. For even myself forgot this one. So phi cross r will give you minus z, with this minus sign will be plus, and this is what I have. And at this point now, before I do the substitution, I will replace r primed which I, with, I, with its cart expression in Cartesian unit vectors. So before I do this further step, I will actually uh, replace so this explicitly shows you that depending on which is your angle this unit vector changes again this comes back to this fundamental confusion that a unit vector is fixed a unit vector is not fixed unless it is a Cartesian unit vector. And you see here from this expression of the r hat unit vector that it will change depending on angle. So it will be going all the way around, depending on which point you are looking uh, to the z-axis. And then the second one is rz. Okay. So now I'm ready to put everything together. For pi, I dl cross r minus r prime is this one. And I have these two terms. Uh, let me uh, put the r prime squared plus z squared, the power of 3. And uh, the vectors, I will put it uh, outside. So z phi primed plus z hat uh, plus r z hat uh, plus uh, r z hat. Okay. So now the d phi dr shows you that you need to do a two-dimensional integration with respect to phi and r and that makes sense because we need to basically uh, move this elementary current whose magnetic flux we found all the way throughout the washer so therefore i have to integrate this and that is my last step 
let me take out all the constants. So now I need to go and integrate these terms with respect to phi and r. Okay. And again, those derivations are relatively simple, but need some patience. Um, to go through each step. So I'm copying over what I have found. Okay. Now what do you notice here? Anything uh, noticeable that can reduce our work? OK, let me just uh, show it step by step then. OK, let me take this first term with the x hat unit vector. As you see, z is constant, came from the coordinate of my observation point. So this is uh, the first term. Uh, the second term will be z y hat. This is y hat unit vector. Uh, sine phi primed, d phi primed. Forget the phi prime here. Okay. So, and the last term will be uh, z hat r um, and uh, z hat r 0 to pi d phi primed and a to b dr primed divided by this 3 over half, this uh, bracket that I uh, forgot before, I need to put it here as well. Okay, so this bracket, the 3 over half, is this r prime squared plus z squared 3 halves. Okay, and here I'm closing my big parenthesis. So now do you notice anything? That's right. So this is integrate to zero. All this integrate to zero. Uh, it is something that we have seen uh, in the bios of our law, and uh, the reason is that whenever you have, let's say, even a ring, not even a washer, even a ring, we showed that if you take the magnetic flux on the z-axis caused by this current, that will end up being uh, something like this. Uh, yeah. And then for every such element, there will be a symmetrical one that will cause a magnetic field like this so that the superposition of the two will be in the z direction. And if you remember the magnetic dipole, the magnetic dipole, that is the current loop along the z axis has a straight magnetic flux line. It has a straight magnetic flux line. So we would expect that we have only a z directed magnetic flux here. So this is a result that of course came out mathematically, but we could have uh, expected it uh, ahead of time. So if I uh, basically uh, collect now the terms that remain as non-zero, this is 2 pi, 
So I will have mu naught, j naught, a, 4 pi and 2 pi will give me a 2. Uh, the whole thing points in the z direction. And the only integral that needs to be done is r. Uh, this is r, not uh, uh, r prime, or it is r prime. It's, uh, let me see where this came from. This was r prime, actually. Sorry about this. So I shouldn't have taken it out of the integral. Let me put it back in. So this belongs here. Yeah. So this belongs inside the integral. So here is what we have, r primed, r prime squared plus z squared, 3 halves, dr primed, a to b. So that is the only integral that remains to be done. This integral is a known integral. from A to B. And then the final result from the Biot-Savart law is Z hat mu naught J naught A over 2 Z squared plus A squared minus Z squared plus B squared. So that is the final answer. And again, the important point here is to do it step by step, carefully uh, calculate everything, make sure that you carry prime coordinates for the sources and prime for the observation point, and uh, otherwise be patient to the end. Again, things like uh, guessing ahead of time the direction of the magnetic field help, because you see that a lot of uh, effort should have been spared if ahead of time we could have guess that you know these terms will have to end up uh, being zero okay uh, so I think that uh, I had a few more examples for electrostatics but uh, uh, probably I'm out of time so therefore I will stop today's lecture again uh, let me ask you to uh, take a moment and complete the course evaluations. And uh, I will announce office hours. My office hours, uh, 12 to 1 on Wednesdays, are in effect, but I will announce additional office hours. And uh, uh, if those don't work for you, send me an email. We can set up an appointment either in person or online. So at this point, I'd like to thank you all for uh, your attention, your uh, participation and wish you all the best for your exams and uh, your future endeavors. Thank you.